Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, and thank you for watching IT Pro TV, helping you level up with IT learning everywhere you go. I'm your host, Zach Memes, for this episode of PF Sense 2.4.4 Open Source Firewall. Set up PF Sense Configure VPN Services Part 2. That's where we are. Thank you for joining us. And also, thank you, Ronnie Wong, for delivering the material we need to see in here. All right, Zach. Well, thank you as well for joining us as we continue on My in PF Sense. And glad that you're also with us as we are now in our part two on VPN services. We just set up a site to site VPN and showed you it could connect through. Uh, and that's usually the verification, right? Because I have done this before where I brought up the tunnel, but for one reason or another, the traffic couldn't flow through. Sometimes that actually kind of boils down to, of course, firewall rules if you're doing that. Okay. So as we pick back up here for just a moment, let's just kind of do a couple of verifications. Yeah of what we've actually done and try to show you some other things that you can do to verify that everything is actually working the way that you want to. Now, I've turned everything off because I've disconnected this for our remote access because I have to reconfigure a lot of VPN stuff uh, and, and virtual machine stuff here, okay? But if you're setting up your VPN and you're ready to check it out and verify, it's right here where you have, of course, the established, which we did see. You also see security associations as well as this, which of course is about the directionality that you have, inbound, outbound, those things will be active. But when you go to firewall and rules, here's some of the other things that you can also check out to see if VPN services are actually working, especially IPsec, mm -hmm. is that normally you also see these ideas of states going on too. So if this number increments while your VPN tunnel is up and active, that's what you'll also end up seeing here. Now, Right now, I've turned it off so we don't have any states that are actually created here, okay? But you can see it evaluated about 3,460 packets uh, or uh, uh, evaluations that it had mm -hmm. ready to go. So everything actually does look uh, pretty good uh, when you start to, to, to check out that. So if you create a firewall rule, and this is something I, I think I did mention during our firewall show, but if you're if it's live and it's active and you're not getting any states going through it, more than likely that lets you know that your firewall rule really isn't being actively used. Mm -hmm. and probably means you can get rid of it and there's not going to be any harm. So if I go back to WAN here, you can see that earlier here I was doing something with OpenVPN. You can see where it actually kept track of the information that went through here. Okay, So the bytes that went through, but now the states are actually gone as well and you can see all these numbers that are happening. So on this one, which doesn't have anything because that's actually done for, that's actually created for my uh, open VPN site to site uh, episode that's going to be coming up in the future. Oh, that's actually just getting ready for something that's happening. Okay. But just kind of realize that you can verify information like that uh, and just checking it out. And of course, the other thing as we get started as well, let me go down to status and then system logs. You have all these log entries that will also help you out as well. So with IPsec, and I know we're getting in remote access, but these were a couple of things I just didn't have time to jam in. So we'll at least take a look. You're making sure that you're getting through and that everything is actually happening and going through. And if you see information here, it's usually a good indication that things are, are going on, they're happening. Right. You keep seeing where it tells you, hey, it's restarting, okay? Or it's not connecting or you don't see any logs coming in. More than likely, it's letting you know that, hey, this isn't really working out the way that you want to. Go back and check out your configuration and your settings again to what needs to be done uh, as well, okay? So IPsec will help you do that. You can also, of course, check out your firewall entries. If you see anything that you set up in your VPN that's being blocked here, you check out source and destination if that's being blocked in terms of your IPsec. You can easily, and this is kind of a neat thing about uh, a PF Sense here, you can simply hover over something like this, and I'm trying to see if I can get that tool tip back up. Easy rule, add to the block list. In other words, sometimes I actually even let you do it to add to an allow list as well, and that way you can do something and, and to really help you out in what you're actually doing, okay? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that you want to make sure that you understand as you're setting uh, this up, okay? All right, so just enough, I know a little bit of a tease here, we're getting into remote access VPNs, so that's what we need to be talking about, but I wanna make sure we covered that too. All right, now I've turned off one of our firewalls because we want to set up this scenario right here. Okay? Oh yeah. Now the scenario that we're talking about is probably more familiar with a lot of us that tend to use laptops and travel for our companies, okay? 
So uh, if you go into the PFSense documentation, you'll see that they actually have a special term coined for those that use uh, remote access VPN. Sometimes they call them road warriors is what they call them. <laughs> and that is because they're constantly on the road. They're changing IP addresses from hotel to hotel or from conference room to conference room. They're changing all those different network connections that they're doing, but they still need access to our regular network resources to be able to do so. Okay. Well, if you're connecting over something like oh, hotel internet access, right? In other words, a network that you do not control, you don't want them making connection back into your network if that is the medium that they're going through, that network that they're going through. So the way that you do that instead, of course, is that you instead can actually bring up what we call an RA client or remote access client, okay? That remote access client essentially establishes that VPN tunnel between your site. I was too lazy to change this. I normally have a laptop here, uh, but I just left a regular desktop. But you can have it on your laptop, and it's a software client instead of it being hardware-based and PFSense-based, site-to-site, that's always up. This gives you the ability to disconnect and reconnect regardless of the network end that you're on. So if everything is actually working the way that it needs to, and you've got this set up, then it's actually fairly easy to do so. This is where something like the Cisco ASA, it does it very nicely. It uses IPsec to do so or L2TP to do so. Mm -hmm. But with uh, the idea here of uh, PFSense, it instead, you can use IPsec, you can use L2TP if you choose to, okay? But the easiest way to actually configure everything uh, to make this work, and it's incredibly efficient to do so, is using what we call OpenVPN, okay? And the nice thing about OpenVPN is if you've never set up the server before, it has the ability to walk you through the entire configuration to do so from the very beginning to the very end, okay? So there's a couple of things you have to do if you're actually gonna do this to get started, but once that's up and going, you actually see that it's relatively easy to set up, and then the hardest part is getting the client over to the machine that you want to be able to do, and for us uh, that are actually doing this in a real live environment, we'll show you what, what we're talking about as well in, in a virtual environment, a little bit more technically challenging then actually, if, if Zach said, oh, I'm, I'm going to be on the road, I need to get the VPN uh, client on my computer so I can make sure that I VPN into work, you know, as I, I, have, I have resources here that I need to get access to. Okay? Because I'm a road warrior. Yep. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the term that uh, I do see in the PFSense documentation as you're doing this. So just kind of realize that there are different documents uh, and, or different uh, ways that people refer to them. But that's probably the most common one I've heard over the past decade or so is that they call them road warriors here. Okay. So how do we get this thing up and running? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to head over to Bravo side. And I, oops, that's the wrong IP address. See, that's what happens when I change things here. Okay. <laughs> so there's the right IP address. We're actually going to use this IP address and we're going to set up a remote access open VPN server is what we're going to do. Great. Okay. And that should then allow, once I get that set up, I can now install a client software onto the machine over here, and that should allow us to build up this tunnel connection and allow access to resources over here on this network is what it should do, okay? So at least ideally, if I create everything correctly, that's what should happen, okay? So let's walk through this process of doing so as, as we choose to. Okay. So there's here's gonna be my client. My Windows 10 machine is gonna be my client. Mm -hmm. So this will actually be the one that's on the uh, laptop, essentially, ironically, it's actually on my laptop here. Uh, and then here's the server that I'm going to be using, which is the uh, PFSense Bravo. So there's my uh, machine here. Just need to verify I had connectivity. And here is, of course, my web GUI, uh, my web configurator GUI here that I can uh, begin to configure, okay? So when we select, our VPN here, okay? Well, if I can choose IPsec, why don't I just use IPsec to do so? Mm -hmm. Well, you can, and as long as you have that ability to not only be able to do this, but the problem that you may also end up having with IPsec here is that it relies on the client that's already built into uh, another device or it relies on the third-party client to do so. And you might be wondering, why does that matter? Well, even though it's essentially a, a standardized framework, right, uh, IP security framework here, it still can be a little bit iffy between different clients, okay? 
For example, probably the most popular version of this that you might see out there is the Cisco AnyConnect. And it works like a charm, it really does. But sometimes it doesn't work well with other equipment, okay? In other words, it might not work well with PFSense's IPsec here, okay? And the way that it's actually established. It might not work well with Palo Alto, okay? It might not work well, but sometimes they do. They work perfectly fine and everything's actually good and up and going. But if they're built into the operating system sometimes, like it is inside the Mac, like it is inside of Linux, like it is inside of Windows, where you can establish this type of connection to do so, you might find out that trying to implement them on all three becomes a little bit more challenging because they actually reword things differently mm -hmm. than the way that you actually configured it, such as on PFSense. Okay? So IPsec is a possibility, and you can still do the same thing. Okay? L2TP is another possibility. This one's much more challenging okay? because it requires a lot more setup to actually go through. You not only have to configure L2TP, but you also have to configure IPsec again because it actually works in conjunction with IPsec. Mm. So you'll be establishing that if you do so. Okay, And then you have to go over to whatever client you're going to use and try and figure out the language there to make sure that all the connections are actually done the way that they're supposed to be. And it can be a little bit confusing at that point. Okay, So what makes OpenVPN essentially kind of a, a, a one of the things that I would choose right off the bat? Okay, One... Easy configuration is probably key and number one to be able to do, okay? Number two here, on the client side, I can generate the client, at least uh, depending on what you do here, okay? On the Windows machine, you can generate the entire package from your own server, okay? And then you can just hand it off, or you can put it on a USB thumb drive, and I can hand it over to Zach. Zach can just go ahead and download that, and then uh, once he does that, he just double clicks on it, and it installs in the way that he wants it to, okay? So all that's actually possible, which means we're not relying on the way that Windows set up how this particular client should connect. We're not relying on how Mac OS set it up. We're not relying on how Linux has actually got it set up to do so. Each one of those can be a little bit, again, like I said, challenging mm -hmm. if you're not used to doing something like this and making it work. Okay, And so you also have to then think about that when you're doing this. Okay, So OpenVPN on Mac OS, and on Windows, it is a breeze to do. When you get into the realm of Linux, though, not as much as a breeze to be able to do, okay? Because you have to, again, go in and install some additional software to make that work on the Linux side. But can it be done? Yes, okay? Does it work? Yes, it works insanely well, too, okay? But just kind of realize that that's some of the stuff that you have to make sure that you can do here, all right? Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to get started with OpenVPN here, okay? The other thing that's also neat about OpenVPN, you don't really have to mess with NAT rules, okay, like you do with IPsec here, okay. The reason why is that instead of IPsec, which runs as its own, uh, you know, different protocols that also go on in the background, right, ESP, AH, all these other different protocols that are actually working in the background here, OpenVPN works over TCP and UDP, okay, mm -hmm. and that means, heck, firewall rules, if you allow for traffic to go out, it goes out if you allow it for it to come in it comes in there's not a special set of everything that you have to be able to do and even if there is especially in pfsense they automatically create the firewall rules for you that you need so let me go ahead and click on open vpn and now if i do not know exactly how i want to set something up okay so Zach, here it is. I'm at the OpenVPN servers. Mm -hmm. I could simply click on servers, and if I do that, then over on the right-hand side, I can click on this Add button, and I just simply fill in all the information there, and should be ready to go, okay? But Zach, if I do that, and I don't know exactly what I'm doing, I'll miss some major components, okay? So the great thing, though, is the way that OpenVPN sets this up. There's also clients, which is uh, what we'll be doing when we do a site-to-site -site type of connection. Specific overrides, if we need to say, hey, on the client, whatever they actually report back to you, do this instead, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But here's what I'm looking for, which is right here. Wizards. Okay, wizards. Okay. Now, before we select Wizards, I want you to notice this option. This is not here by default. Okay. And that's what I want to make sure that you understood. So you'll see client export on mine. Mm -hmm. The reason why you see a client export on mine is because I went to System and Package Manager we we'll take a look at this idea of installed packages here in a moment, but I don't have a real internet connection on my particular device here, or at least maybe it's actually being retrieved in format. But available packages are things that it can download from the internet to make it more efficient. But if this doesn't come in, I don't know why it would come in, but if it doesn't, 
it's because I downloaded the package for that uh, client export service in OpenVPN. Okay? Mm -hmm. I was hoping that the list would show up right here, but it looks like I may actually require internet connection to do so. But I wanted to isolate this so it wouldn't actually cause any problems. So that's what it looks like it's happening. It says be patient. Uh, but we'll go on while we're trying to be patient. At the same so we, time. we can use this to add optional packages. Yep. Right. And we'll be taking a look at doing that in a later episode. But mm -hmm. for right now, we just want to make sure that we get through this. So if you open this up for the first time, this will not be there. I went ahead and did this because I knew we were doing this episode and I didn't want to connect out to the internet. But that's the one that you'll do, which is the OpenVPN client export package is the one that you want. So we'll select the wizard here. Okay. Now, people that say, hey, why would you use a wizard? I know how to do this. Because I can miss stuff. The wizard ensures that you do what? You walk through step by step. Step by step. How you can actually configure this. Okay. Now, the neat thing about OpenVPN as well, just like everything else in IPsec, you can actually use any type of authentication server that you want to. Okay. So you can do it locally, which is the one that I'm going to choose because I chose not to set up an LDAP directory. I chose not to even set up Radius here. So I'm going to choose local user here. Okay. Is what I'm going to do because that's the way that we're going to set that up. I'm going to click next here. And now it's asking me for a certificate authority. Okay. Now I previously had set up an actual certificate on this machine to do so. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you can simply add a new CA and that will walk you through the steps of setting this up as well. Okay. Now, if I show you, let me kind of show you the, the, what, what happened here. So system cert manager, one of the first things you're going to need to do is actually create your own certificate authority here. Now, do you have to know if you have a third party certificate, you can come here and you can select add. So if you've got one from, let's say, uh, VeriSign or something, right? All you have to do is select this and import an existing certificate authority. You can use the VeriSign certificate if you want to, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that will end up working for you as well, okay? But here's the one that I generated because I didn't actually go out and get one as well. So you can generate this self-signed certificate. You can choose... And there's the certificate data, uh, and there's the private key. Oops, i got to zoom in. But you're actually just creating that certificate authority, and then every other certificate that's generated at that point would then be generated based off of that certificate authority. So from here, you can add in your own server certificate to be used with, oh, servers, like OpenVPN. So here is the one that I created for OpenVPN. Okay, here's the server certificate. And the way that you do that is you click Add, and once again, you tell it you can create an internal certificate. And at that point, you just select all the options that you want to. And that's the way that ends up working. Okay. Now let's go back to that uh, wizard again, because I kind of stopped halfway through, but I wanted to show you that. All right. So we're not going to add in a new one at this point. We're just going to use the one that exists. And all the ones that are existing will also show up here as a drop down for you. I'm going to click next. And now it's going to say, hey, that's the certificate authority. What certificate? If you haven't generated a certificate, you can actually do that here. Okay. You can see also generated one for my user account as well, because we're going to be using that in our remote access uh, to be able to do something. So I can add in a new one, but I'm just going to click next. So there's a certificate for the server. Make sure you take a look at the term server here. Click next. And now there it is. Server setup, open VPN remote access server setup wizard. Now it gives us this ability to choose the options that we want. So if I'm doing remote access here, I'm going to select UDP only. Now, can I select TCP? Yeah. Notice you can actually select all these. You can do a combination of IP version 4, IP version 6, especially if you're multi-homing everything. So it's all up to you. Now, why would you actually choose UDP over TCP? UDP is probably the default, and it's probably the faster of the two methods to use. Remember that when you use TCP, it means that you have to do that handshake negotiation mm -hmm. for everything that actually ends up happening here. So on this one, the default port is 1194, and I'm just going to use that for the default port, 1194. And unless you just choose to, and you might choose to actually use a different port number, it doesn't really matter so much what you choose, but uh, here it is. I'm just going to use the default one. And give it a description here. And this one is not site to site. This one is going to be for remote access open VPN. Okay. So that way we have that description. I'm also going to change the cryptographic settings here. Okay. So I'm going to accept, of course, that user certificate to be able to connect in. So I'm going to generate my own TLS key. Okay. 
and make sure we can do TLS authentication. I'm going to leave the DH parameter uh, for the Diffie Hellman key exchange here at 2048. If your security policy right for your organization requires higher, set it higher. Okay. So notice you can go all the way up 1634. That would probably eat up my drive like crazy. But even this, that's a pretty good chunk. Uh, but if your machine can handle it, you can do that as well. Mm -hmm. Encryption algorithm. This is not where it defaults to. I think it normally defaults to AES 128 GCM, but I could be wrong. I, se I selected earlier when I did this as well to AES-256. You also have that ability to select all these. Now, you do want to be careful. Remember that when you see these letters after it, it does matter, okay? So make sure you choose the one that best suits your organization and follows the certificate, uh, your, your uh, security practices too, okay? So that's what we're actually seeing here. All right, uh, the authentication digest, I'm still going to leave it at 256. If you have hardware crypto, Okay, so notice that, well, I'm inside of a VM. It does say that I can do this, but I'm not going to because I'm actually on a virtual machine and there is no uh, 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 cryptography acceleration for me. Okay, so it says hardware cryptography accelerator to use for this VPN connection. So if you have that ability to do so, the recommendation, of course, is yes, take advantage of that to mm -hmm. be able to do this. Okay, now on a remote access VPN, we're actually going to change this one to 90 here is what we're going to do. And I'm going to actually set this up for the entire network. Now, the reason why I might choose this, right? Here's a network that you are going to use, not for anything else except for people connecting in from the outside. So let me go back to my diagram here just for a moment if I can find it. And I've zoomed in pretty good. There we go. Okay. So when I chose 192.168.90.0, uh, uh, okay, the IP addresses over here on any of the clients that connect in from regardless of where they are in the world, They'll end up getting IP address of 192.168, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 90 dot whatever. Okay, they'll get an IP address that way. That way, when they log in and the logs that are generated over here on the firewall, it should show me from that particular range, and that means I know what it came in on. Okay, usually that's going to be a particular subnet that is not in use, so we're not using 40. Okay, we're not actually going to do that. If there's other subnets behind my firewall, I don't want to choose any of those. I want to choose a particular network that's going to be what I want it to be, but it's not currently in use. Let me flip back over here. All right, so there's that tunnel network that we're talking about. Okay. Also, if you're doing this from the Road Warrior perspective, right, you don't want that network adapter of whoever, whatever wireless that they're connecting to. So that local traffic, in other words, if it's going to anywhere besides your network, be able to leave your laptop and go through the hotel's network instead, okay? You want to make sure that if you're actually tunneling everything, you're forcing all clients to generate traffic through the tunnel. Mm -hmm. So that means it's a secured connection that way instead of saying, all right, so I'm connecting into IT Pro TV's network. Oh, uh, Zach is actually going to be browsing Facebook and IMDB on his laptop. And that actually goes to a different uh, a router instead. So the idea here for more security is to redirect that gateway to make sure that that happens too. Makes perfect sense. That's about uh, security. Also, what network you're giving them access to. Make sure you put that here. And this is our 30 dot network on the Bravo machine over here. And from that point, I'm going to leave the default notices. This is the open VPN default. You can change the compression to what you want it to be. Okay. That's all up to you again, depending on whether or not you want to do any compression. At this point, I'm just going to use the default because, yeah, I don't really care on this particular setting. But if I, there was a requirement for me to do so, I have that. You can even do type of service if you want to, classification, inter-client communication, duplicate connections. Dynamic IPs allows connected clients to retain their IP connection if their actual IP address changes. Now, this is kind of neat, right? If you've ever had this happen where you've gone to a bigger building, okay, and what can happen is that between different wireless access points, right, you can drop the connection and pick back up. In theory, you shouldn't lose your IP address, but there is a chance that you might between that, okay, or your DHCP times out because open wireless connections, especially in busy places, might not connect you for more than 15 minutes at a time, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you might choose something like this instead and now it says, hey, even if you're actually changing something like that, retain that connection. Okay, it's perfectly fine. That's pretty cool. 
Subnet, one address per client and a common subnet. So all the people connecting in, they'll be inside that dot ninety network. Yes, right. We'll see. You can provide a default domain name. I just simply put in ours, a DNS servers. You name it, you can actually configure all the rest of the stuff the way that you want it to be reported out. And even set up wins here if you're really, well, I don't know why you would actually still do that, but you can still do it if you choose to. Okay, we're gonna click next. And now in the end, this is kind of the one that I was talking about in terms of missing information, okay? So if we start to take a look at something like this, notice it tells you that you've got a couple of things here, okay? Firewall rule configuration, open access server here. Notice what it says, firewall rules, what network traffic is permitted, rules must be allowed, must be added to allow open uh, VPN's IP uh, server and port, okay? As well as allowing the traffic connected through the client, uh, from the connected clients through the tunnel. These can be automatically added here or we can manually set it up. Now for me, I'm gonna choose, well, automatic. So I just put a check mark here. Now, it doesn't mean I can't do it manually. No, it means you absolutely can do this manually, okay? But for me, because I don't want to miss anything, I click there and I click finish. And now my open VPN server is ready to go. Now, before I take a look at it, let me go back to the rules here. And now you'll see that there's an option for open VPN, okay? Awesome. Before we had IPsec in our previous episode where we set that up and added this end, now we have open VPN, and you can see here where there's a couple of times uh, that I've done this already, okay? By default, the one that it actually just added in is the one here on the bottom, mm -hmm. okay? Now, even though it gives you access, it says any source to any destination, the recommendation, though, is to make it more restricted. So what I would probably choose to do instead is this one, okay? Where I'm saying I only want it if it comes in on this address instead over open VPN. Because anybody with open VPN then, they could come in with any uh, tunnel address that they want to, or they can try at least and see if they can make that connection. So these other ones here, I can get rid of if I want to. Let me see. Let me select one of these two. But usually the wizard generates that. And I just uh, didn't do that. Let me delete those. Okay. And that should be fine. And of course, you can modify the default if you want to. Let's see if it added anything to the WAN connection. And in the WAN connection, it did. It actually is looking for the default port there. So you see where it says 1194. Mm -hmm. And this is all making sure that we can make the connection that we need to. So that allows for remote access VPN to come in. This one is not going to come into play. So I can disable that one. And apply the changes. So it just generated the same one that I did a little bit earlier, which is fine. All right. So... Those are the two rules that I might have just forgotten if I was just configuring the OpenVPN server itself. All right, Zach, now that we've got that done, the rest is actually relatively simple because the client doesn't really have to do anything. Okay? Right. So how do we actually say now that Zach says, hey, or let's say it's Ronnie because I think I just created an account for Ronnie. Okay. <laughs> well, if you create an account for Ronnie, you have to actually be able to go to system and then you go to user manager and you create an account for Ronnie is what you do. Okay, mm -hmm. fairly simple. Click add, create an account. Make sure you add him into a group here okay, is what you want to be able to do. Okay, you don't have to make him an admin, uh, but I even created a group that was called uh, at one point here uh, on a real firewall called remote VPN users. And you simply get a group name. The key here is once you hit save, because you don't see many options here, so we'll just do that. Remote VPN users. And then I'm going to select Ronnie and move to the members here. Click save. It's not so much the name that matters, but if you go down through here, and I'm not going to worry about because I assigned myself to the administrators group here, but it's right here where it says assigned privileges. Okay. So on those assigned privileges here, let me see if I can get that above my head. I really can't. Okay. I was trying to. You click add, and this is where you can add in privileges so that people can access in. So I might add in like VPN here. Now, None of this stuff actually seems to make, a, you know, so like here where it says VPN, that's all I'm looking for. I don't care what this other stuff says. So I just want to make sure I get give privileges that I need to. Now I can say, select save. Now anybody in that group now has those privileges. Okay. So that's the, the goal and the idea behind that if you were to do something like that. But I'm not going to worry about saving that because I know that it's working because I'm part of the administrator's group. 
Mm -hmm. All right, so now that we've got that, let's go back to our OpenVPN server. Then we simply select Client Export. Verify that you are selecting the right remote access server and the right port number, because these can change. Host name, we're just gonna leave as the interface uh, here, which is perfectly fine with me. You can even do DNS name, we have DNS all set up for you. Leave it as the verify. Uh, automatic is what I normally leave that at. And then once we have all that done, I'm not gonna worry about uh, exporting any other things than we need to. Because the only thing that I really want is now, notice down here, it actually has my name. And then open VPN client. I can now save my connection. And the one that I want is the current VPN installer. And that will now save the file here. And from that saved file, Close that terminal for a moment. What it ends up looking like is this thing right here, okay? So that is a .exe which doesn't run inside of Ubuntu. So I need to be able to copy that over to my virtual machine. But this one, can be a little bit different here, at least I think it is. So this is where it should not be as difficult for you because all you would do is actually copy it to, let's say, a thumb drive, mm -hmm. and then you would hand it over to Zach or to myself. Just make sure that it shows up. And now I just put it into a shared file between those two systems is what I did. Okay. That means I can come over here, get access to that shared folder, and I'll zoom in here in just a moment. And here it is. I'm just going to copy that to the desktop. So that you can see it and then simply install it and that will install the entire software the client and everything through the open vpn server and it may take longer than that but just kind of realize that that's what you want to be able to do now this one's a little bit weird we'll have to go behind my head this time because it's not really easy to see this so uh, usually it creates a, an icon on your desktop, but even that, when you double click on it, it tells you, go down here to your system menu, and what you're looking for, if it uh, shows up, why didn't it show up here? All right, let me run it first, let me see. Unless I didn't do it, we'll do open VPN. Let's see if it box at me here. Ah, I forgot to run it, there we go. Okay, so it shows up, and then when you hover over this, there it is, open VPN GUI. Mm -hmm. And I select connect. Now ask right here, and here's the client and everything. Ask me for my password. He is, did I actually remember the password? And I connect in. And there it goes, okay? So in a moment, notice what you're seeing. It says successful ARP and flushed on the interface. Mm -hmm. If it disappears, that's the way you can tell. But if you take a look behind my head again, You'll see down here, okay, where it tells you it is now connected, okay? And it tells me what the IP address that was assigned here to do so. And the little icon turns green. I don't know, you can barely see that, but this little tiny icon right here turns green, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so now what does that give me that ability to do? Let's see if I can access a network resource. So now if I do HTTP, and this time, I have a, a Nginx, uh, Nginx server up, at least I think I do. And there we go, okay? So this is the server that I'm running on inside of my own uh, a firewall on the Bravo network that I have ready to go. Mm -hmm. And it shows me that I am able to access those resources, okay? So now this is my machine directly connecting in instead of me needing to set up another firewall or another router or anything else to go in between to do so, okay? So it really is a popular implementation because it's so easy and the client normally again comes across in different ways and different accesses that you can do, okay? Mm -hmm. You can pay for some of these clients that are really nice and fancy for you. 
So some of them, like uh, the Viscosity bundle, is actually a very popular bundle. It works on both Mac OS as well as Windows. They have options for that. The one that I use on Mac OS is one that's called Tunnel Blick. Uh, is the one that I use. The reason why it's free uh, is, is what I can do. And when I generate that particular package, all I have to do is I click and I drag it onto the icon. Tunnel Blick. It goes ahead and makes the configuration. I just hit Connect, and it connects me up to the IT Pro TV network, and I'm off and I'm ready to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Zach, at this point, we've gone ahead and we created an IPsec connection. Okay. Yes. Where we did the site to site connection in our first episode. This time, we showed you how you can do remote access using OpenVPN, kind of the simplest one, but it is very effective and very easily manageable at this point too. Let's take a look at just uh, since I've got just a minute here left. Okay. Let's take a look at what that looks like on the on the monitoring side a little bit. We'll go to status and open VPN. And here you're actually seeing there's the connection and you're looking for, of course, data that's coming through. If it's not coming through, you need to check your connections again. So if you're not getting anything showing up here. Then of course, if I go down to open VPN, uh, not open VPN, system logs. Let's see, does it show up here? Open VPN. You can now see the open VPN connections are also coming in here too, okay? So here's the IP address that I was using on the outside from my machine, just trying to connect in. You're trying to verify that that traffic is also getting through. And we showed you, of course, that it works by just going to the Nginx server uh, over on that 192.168.30. network. So we have that connection. Let me disconnect here. And let's verify that it drops the connection. So let me disconnect. Now, if I close that out and let's launch a browser again. We need to be more careful here. We'll launch it in incognito mode, hopefully clearing out the cache. So I do HTTP 30.101. Notice nothing is now coming in, okay? So we do see where it actually does take that VPN client to make sure we get connection into our secured network, okay? So Zach, mm -hmm. we've really got just one more to go, which is of course setting up the open VPN site to site. But I wanted to at least show you those first two because those are probably the most popular ones that you still do see just about everywhere, uh, you know, as well. Okay, so Zach, that's a good place for us to stop, and then our next episode, we'll take a look at setting up site-to-site -site, uh, open VPN connection. Awesome work, Ronnie. Set up PFSense Configure VPN Services Part Two. Please join us for Part Three and watch every single episode of PFSense 2.4.4 Open Source Firewall. You're going to be so glad you did. It's going to help you now and in the future. And keep studying inside our course library. There is a lot of supplementary information that's in there to do one thing. Help you go even further. So check that out too. And tell everybody you know about IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is binge worthy. Thanks for watching. I'm Zach Memis. And I'm Ronnie Wong. We will see you again soon. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.